The following program is brought to you in part by the film Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Welcome to another Leon China Report. We have with us a very prominent guest. His name is Ellie Wiesel, Professor Ellie Wiesel, renowned scholar, Nobel laureate, writer, and uh, I guess an outspoken critic of those who deny the Holocaust. And we'll talk a lot about that today and other things. But I have a surprise personality that I bring up with Ellie, who uh, will be a little bit in shock when I say that, in my opinion, he's a Lamed Vovnik, which means there are 36 righteous people who take care to make sure that Sirth stays righteous, and his name is Dov Yukovsky. What do you say? Well, I, I agree, he's a friend. But he's not Ramad Bovnik. Ramad Bovnik is somebody who remains unknown, secretive. So I just I took him apart. <laughs> and you're just took him apart. Oh, you amazed me. <laughs> you, deprived, you deprived him of his title. I, Dov, you left it. I have to apologize. Uh, but he is the edit, was the editor of the Adir Ahronot, which is the largest newspaper in Israel, and I believe Eli started his career at the Adir Ahronot. Yes, he's, he's actually Yuda Moses, the old the founder. He's the one who, who, who hired me in 1950. Yuda or Noach? I knew him very well. Noach Moses. Noach Moses, Paula Moses, Paul I know the Moses. entire family. And as, uh, as you know, when I worked for Yediot, it was the poorest paper in the country. Now it's the richest, and it became rich when I left it. So, Did I you know uh, Shaiki Ben Porat at that time? Not only that. I, when I left New York, I gave him uh, my position. Is that right? Yeah, so he, he became a correspondent in, in, in Paris. This is inside stuff, but it's very interesting. And Paula Moses, who was the wife of Noach Moses and a cousin of Yudkovsky, which is the largest newspaper, as I said, Yediot Rachronon, would bring in all her friends and great reporters Friday afternoon and cook the filter fish for them. For me, she made latke. <laughs> I gotta be different. <laughs> anyway, it's good to have a laugh, Ellie, because the world doesn't look that uh, that exciting in terms of laughter today. Um, one of the, well, would you believe in your lifetime, a man uh, like you have seen the Holocaust, been through it, written about it? that you would see so much denial as it's coming out, even from the mouths of presidents of sovereign countries like Iran? Well, I wouldn't have believed it. But what I would not have believed either is the way this man was received. He came to the United Nations as president, invited to the Council of Foreign Relations and to all kinds of other organizations, and I think it's a disgrace. This man, I, I was waging campaign, I still wage this campaign. He should be declared persona non grata all over the world, simply to be excluded from any civilized society, because this man deserve, does not deserve to be accepted or welcomed anywhere. He is the number one Holocaust denier in the world. And what does he say? He said, there was no Holocaust, but there will be one. And he even said, who is going to do it? He. He said he wants to destroy Israel. And this man was received by the Council of Foreign Relations. They wanted to give him a dinner. So I raised hell and they canceled the dinner. So I had half a victory. <laughs> but the other half is not. They went on and they met him. And it was a disgrace. Does it bother you that some of the members of the Council who are Jewish didn't come stronger into uh, trying to make sure that he wasn't able to present himself? No, they were those that I know were strong, except I had an idea. To, to organize a mass resignation of the Jewish yeah. members. But they said no, so I, we didn't do it. Also, they canceled the dinner, so it was a kind of, but the fact is, we should have. What is the strategic effect of that? Tell me. I mean, is it, obviously, there are a lot of liberal Jews who think in freedom of press and, and the Constitution, et cetera, et cetera, and there are probably people who would disagree and say we should let them speak. Bring me philosophically what these people are thinking. And you, you know, probably if we study Germany, there may have been uh, some people in 1929, 1930 who said Hitler was uh, freely elected, so she, he should have had the right to, to speak. 
where, where do you draw those lines and how do you stop them? First of all is the Holocaust denial. I would never sit in the same room with somebody who is a Holocaust denier and he is a Holocaust denier. Right. Second is the man who wants to destroy the state of Israel, which to me means to destroy the Jewish people. I would not give him the dignity of a debate. So where do you draw the line? That is the line. So I was in Israel now and you're going tonight. What do you think the Israeli political system should do with, with personalities like, like, should they talk about him? Should they deny him? Should they organize conferences against him? Could the, could the government of Israel do anything? Or do you think it's left to people like you and outspoken uh, historical figures who, who should really come to the forefront? No, Israel is speaking up. Israel, the Israel delegation left the General Assembly Hall when, when he began speaking. They made statements, good statements. The ambassador of Israel, I alone, wrote that to the New York Times, which was then uh, responded by the New York Times. So it, they are doing it. We don't do enough. I mean, we Jews in the diaspora, we are free, really. We are free, and we don't use our freedom to proclaim freedom and to protect it by simply saying some of the people who want not only to kill freedom, but to kill those who celebrate freedom. In, in our case, let's say, as Jews in Israel, I think they should be punished, not physically or somehow, punished morally. They should be condemned morally. And that is something which is so clear. We don't even have to, to argue the case. It's clear. There are some people that when they speak, and they speak with hatred, the hatred becomes a wall. The problem I think that the American government had, I think George Bush even had a problem whether to allow this fellow to come in and speak. And I think they restricted him. I don't know if they can. No, 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 they cannot stop him because he, came to, the, he came to the UN. Right. But as, as a, somebody who comes only to the UN is restricted, I think, a few miles. I don't know how many miles. He right. can, he can, within that perimeter, he cannot go. He couldn't go, let's say, to, to another place, another city. It has to be to the UN. Do you, I had many people on a show discussing this guy. Do you take him literally that he's out to destroy Israel or as some people say he's only using it to, uh, to get his population revved up or to get his, uh, his polls? What do you do? Leon, you and I belong to a people and to a generation that taught us to take the enemy's threat seriously. Some of our people didn't and they lived to regret it or died to regret it. So you take him literally? Absolutely. If he could. Is there a doubt in your mind that if he has the nuclear weapon, he would use it against Israel? He said so. Why shouldn't I trust his word? You'll be surprised, Eli. I've talked to some generals in Israel. I've interviewed them even on this show. And they'll... I, I agree with you. I'm a hardliner on that. There are two uh, great rabbis in Israeli uh, Talmudic history. One was Hillel, one is Shammai. Shammai was very strict, and Hillel was a little bit more liberal. I am Shammai on this, as you are, because I think you must take him literally, and you must defend against him. And thank God I did not go through the Holocaust, and you understand it and, and live through it. But there are people who say that uh, we shouldn't take him that seriously, that Iran is 50% uh, Persian and they're anti this and anti that, and there's ethnicity in that school, in that uh, country, and uh, we, we, we shouldn't worry about it that much. I, I take the opposite position. I take the position that you take. Uh, the question is, does he have the power to do this at this moment? From all the sources, of information that I have access to, that he has the power. Really? Absolutely. If he wants, what, whatever he wants to do, he does. The truth is, Iran is the enemy, much more than Iraq. When the Iraqi war began, I was in Israel a few times. I also spoke to generals in power. And they said, the real enemy is really Iran. Right. They said it then, they say it now. And therefore, I'm convinced that Israel and the United States and some European countries will not allow Iran to become nuclear, no matter what, at any price. I take another position. The reason Iran, its blatant anti-Semitism is because there's no border with Israel. They don't have any border conflict. Iran does not have any border conflicts with Israel. So all they have is pure 
anti-Semitism that's uh, coming out of the mouth of their president. Because if you look at it in a geographic way or a topographical way, you could say Syria, okay, they're looking for borders, uh, Jordan is looking for borders, Egypt is looking for borders. All these wars are basically about borders. The, the Hamas and Palestinians, they're trying to establish their state. But Iran is out there. It's like this uh, fellow from Malaysia, he also was pretty anti-Semitic. Uh, I forgot his name. He wanted also to destroy the Jewish people. So, what? That, that is a difference, Leon. Iran is, you say, is not there. Iran is there. It's powerful. The, okay. new, the new element in the equation is Iran. What is Hezbollah? What is Hamas? Iran is, is, is giving the money. Iran is sending the weapons. Iran is sending officers to train the Hezbollah. And what does Hezbollah want? Territory? No. Borders? No. no. Hezbollah wants to destroy Israel. I said the same thing two weeks ago. Hezbollah is only to destroy. It's not territory because there's no. Sure. They, 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 they give you a song and dance about Sheba mm -hmm. Farm, but it's a joke because Syria doesn't even claim Sheba Farm. And that is Iran. Right. Behind so Hezbollah is Iran. I agree with you. Hezbollah is totally, I said it on the show, totally anti Semitism. And they're connected now with Hamas, so it, yeah. it's all one game. So, so the question is, you have uh, convened in Petra a group of Nobel laureates mm -hmm. to try and bring peace and humanity to, to this world. How is that working? It worked very well. Really. Uh, it, it was actually an association between King Abdallah and, and myself. And he, my little foundation and his huge foundation did it technically and org organically. It worked very well. We invited... Uh, almost new prime minister, and Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, to come. They did not come together. So I had one-on-one on one conversations with them in front of all the Nobel laureates and so forth. It was great. And then there was a breakfast, and they met, and they hugged each other. And I want you to know, it was a moment of glorious promise. And in our presence, at that breakfast, they decided already about uh, scientific cooperation, about economic cooperation, education. They began something. But then, three, day, three, three, one, three weeks later, Hezbollah came and, 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 and destroyed everything. But we shall continue anyway. It was a great moment then. Ellie, what was your position on Narek Sharon's pullout from Gaza? What, what were your thoughts about that? I have a rule. I never criticize Israel. Whoever, whoever the president or prime minister is, if I don't live there, I, I don't share Israel's suffering except from far. And what Israel does, if I cannot praise, I, I try. If it goes beyond certain norms, I go to Israel, see the prime minister face to face, and I tell him of my pain or of my uh, desires and so forth, whether he listens or she listens, or uh, in the case of Golda. But uh, if, if Alex Sharon, after all, who's a hero, he saved Israel in 73. If he felt that they had to pull out of Gaza, who am I to tell them don't, really? I don't live there. It's a good rule. we got to cut for a break. We'll come right back. Uh, Ellie and I are on the same page. I, as an American, never criticize Israel. I tell the people that Israelis have a right to decide their own destiny, and we have a right to, and should not only right, we should support them. We'll be right back. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high. To have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Winner of the Telly Award for Best Cultural Program. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. Now get the book the hit movie was based on, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the backdoor channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty. Become a witness to history and order backdoor channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order backdoor channels. We're back. I'm talking with Ellie Wiesel, who really needs no introduction. What was your latest book, by the way? It was a big seller. Uh, well, Ellie. The Oprah Winfrey, she That was the first book. It became a bestseller now. Oh, really? 
What was the name Night. of it? Night. Night. Night was my very first book. The yeah. first book I read of yours was called Beggar in Jerusalem. That was my tenth book or something. Sorry. No, two of my books had special destinies at that time. Night, which uh, many people read but didn't buy. <laughs> <laughs> And the Beggar in Jerusalem, which many people bought, but didn't read. <laughs> so I had a choice there. It was a hard book, Beggar in Jerusalem. See? You m may not remember, you m will remember, that at the same time the Beggar in Jerusalem came out, a fellow named Gerald Green did a hundred-part series or something oh, about I, the Holocaust. Come on, I was then. And Being you were very that. upset. And I debated you on a Bill Box show about it. <laughs> and you called it, I think, uh, uh, Corn Flakes uh, Holocaust or something. I still remember that. It was the beginning. It was the beginning of a process Why? Of, of trivialization or banalization of the Holocaust, and I, I protested in the New York Times. I became then for, for almost twenty years. They asked me to to, to review uh, not books. I would never criticize a book, and if the book is bad, if it's bad, let somebody else do it. I cannot do it. But I speak about television, which is not my field. But I don't. I didn't examine it from that angle, but simply as tr truth. I am against docudramas. You cannot mix fiction and truth. You cannot. In, in our tradition, we call it shutness. You know, we, we cannot. <laughs> shutness means you mix the two quads, and it's against the... It's uh, against the law, biblical law. <laughs> so you cannot do that. It's either fiction or to, together. It's, it, it, it's false. And I went on, you know, Hollywood is Hollywood, and television is television, and, and, and they have their say. But the, the question at that time was, was it bringing the point of the Holocaust to, let's say, 100 million viewers who really may not have thought about it in depth? And that was the question. That I think that's a structure that people have to think about. You're an educator. You're a professor. Do the young people who, who, who see you, speak to you, do they know much about the Holocaust? Does a 20-year-old know much about the Holocaust? Much more than, than 20, 30 years ago. Is that right? Absolutely. Look, when I began teaching some 36 years ago, there were very few professors who taught that subject, maybe one or two. And therefore, I accepted for two years to give one course for two years. Now you have in the hundreds, if not the thousands of professors who do that. And all over the American scene, anyway, you should know that the classes are full, overfilled, overcrowded. They want to know more. Why, why do you think that is, Ellie? It takes sometimes more than a generation for the meaning of an event to catch up with, with, with the person who, uh, who wants to understand the event. So you think that 20-year-olds today really are, are, are real? That's interesting. That's a good statistic to know because there are a lot of trouble on the campuses today between the Palestinian rights and the Israeli uh, people, the kids who, who fight for Israel. I, I don't know that much about it. I don't visit the campuses that much, but you must know a lot about it. Well, my campus there is no problem, Boston University. And I must say, I go around after all in the country. I right. speak to many, 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 many students, most of them non-Jews, because there are more non-Jews than Jewish students. And I have yet to encounter a conflict. I have not personally. Is that right? I have personally not witnessed one of them. Now, have you heard any uh, ramifications about this word "disproportionate" in the Lebanese war between, you know, Israel, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Have, have you heard anything like that in, in the campuses? Nothing. No. First of all, look, I, 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 I teach philosophy. I, I speak about literature, I, I, humanities, of course, as a Jew always. And I always say, as a Jew who loves Israel, I love Israel. Uh, in this case, Leon, Israel itself is doing the soul searching. So we don't have to do it for them. They are doing it. And, and the generals uh, have problems to accept the, the reality, what, what, what happened, why. Look, Israel had a tradition, a military tradition, in and out. They would come in, do what they had to do, and leave quickly. Right. For the first time, they didn't. So you know very well. You, you read Israeli press, and, and you, you speak to Israel, as I do every day, my friends in Israel. They have a problem to explain that, or to accept. They accept it now. But you know what I found on the table, Elliot, and you'll see it when you go to your sukkah for the first time in, in my uh, short memory or long memory, people talk about whether Israel can exist. 
In Israel itself? In Israel itself. They talk about it when you go and you'll visit everybody. You're not going to hear it from every person, but you will hear it from, from a lot of people. It's been put on the table for the first time. I've never heard that. But I have read in, the, in America, there are certain intellectuals who say that, and they say Israel was a mistake. Right. I don't want to mention their names, but some of them say it was a mistake, my God. What does it mean, a mistake? It's a mistake, you can simply erase it. And you will erase six million Jews again. Uh, in Israel, I know there was one article that was published in a certain economic paper saying something like that, that doubting the existence. Uh, I doubt, I had a great teacher, Shaul Lieberman, I'm sure you know the name, was a great, one of the great Talmudic scholars. Professor since, at the Jewish Theological seminary. seminary. I believe since the Gaon of Vilna, but didn't have somebody like him. The Vilna Gaon was also a pretty good scholar. He uh, basically, because he was so scholarly, uh, he gave rise to Hasidim, which were people who uh, said that you don't have to be intellectual to get to uh, to the Jewish God, but uh, you can do it through song and dance, etc. If he knew that you said that he gave rise to Hasidism, he would turn in his <laughs> He would <head>. turn over. <laughs> but you know, there's a lot of mixed marriages now between them. No, of course. There's a lot. But my teacher, I remember in 67, 67, you remember three weeks before the Six Day War, everybody was afraid, correct? Right. I lived in fear. I wasn't married yet, I was single. And of course, I remember I decided to go, when the war breaks out, I go to Israel. Everybody thought Israel would lose the war. Right. Except Lieberman. Really? And I said to him, Lieberman, how? What do you mean? We, are all, we live in fear. We panic. And he smiled. He said, look, you don't know Wall Street. I know Wall Street. I think he was wrong, but he pre pretended to understand stocks. <laughs> he said, <laughs> he said in, in the world of finances, it's very simple. If the bank gives a huge amount of money to, a, to an industry, the bank cannot retreat anymore. The That's bank true. is caught. He's right, by the way. So, see? So he said, God invested so much in the Jewish people, he cannot abandon us anymore. <laughs> He was right. Good rationale. It, you know, that's an interesting point. Uh, a good friend of mine died this year, Arthur Hertzberg. And he was schooled at the Jewish Theological Seminary. You had scholars there like Finkelstein, Lieberman, Heschel. They were great, Spiegel, Heschel, they were great Ginsburg, scholars. Very great scholar. And they were basically Orthodox Jews, weren't they? Mm -hmm. So how did they, what was their rationalization for, for the seminary, conservative seminary? No, they believed simply that the conservative movement was created by the reform movement, right. not by the orthodoxies. Right. Geiger, huh? In, he Geiger was in, in, Germany, in Germany, was reform. But here in America, in America, the Jewish, Jewish Logical Seminary was created by the leaders of the reform movement, who felt all of a sudden they went too far. And too therefore, they, left. Yeah, so they created the conservative movement. And the, uh, Arthur Hertzberg showed me a letter that the great Rabbi Salvechik from Yeshiva University had applied to the Jewish Theological Seminary for a job because it's very hard to make money during the Depression times. And, and Hertzberg, who had two ordinations, one was an Orthodox ordination from his father in Baltimore and the other from the Jewish Theological Seminary. And that was his way of showing that the seminary was a citadel of great uh, Talmudic learning, etc. And you're right, they had great scholars Very over there. Great. It's the greatest in the world. Uh, have you, do you visit the seminary now at all? Not now, no. I was the last one was actually who was Gershon Cohen. And, and I had a friend who, was, who is in Israel, David Weiss Salivni. And, and to my, we were the Heide Haver, we went together to school, and, and he's now in Israel. Halevni is a great Talmudic scholar, great scholar, huge. Yeah, so as long now as he as left the seminary when they let women be ordained, am I correct? Correct, and then he went to Colombia. You think an NBC reporter would know that if he interviewed him? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Only what from else, his research, what else, guys. What else should he know? <laughs> Halevni is considered uh, by most Today, people I know. Today, one of the greatest Talmudic scholars alive, absolutely, no <laughs> doubt. What is uh, the Talmudic mind? A mind, a curious, inquisitive mind. Talmud really is based on dialogue. The most tolerant corpus is a Talmudic corpus. You mentioned Shammai and Hillel. They didn't agree on anything, but they respected one another. And their disciples, usually disciples are, are, are more, more voracious than their, their teachers. They were so close to one another. 
that they intermarry, intermarry. That means they marry each other's <laughs> sons and daughters. They ate at the same table. Absolute respect. Talmud really means study. The study of Talmud means to study, study. But, but it's based on, on always on dialogue. Do you study Talmud? Every day. There is something called Daf Yomi, where you study a yes. page. Every, you do that? Really? No, no, it was created by Rabbi Meir uh, from Lublin, the Shiva Chachme Lublin. And they study, what is it, one Daf, one, one, one page. page a day? No, I study the, uh, problem, the problems problematically. I take a suya, what we call, and I study it through with all the commentaries. Do you find uh, there are great uh, Talmudic scholars being born now? Uh, do you, on, on the level that you know, do you, do you meet with them? Born? I don't. I, <laughs> if they're born today, I don't think I. Will. <laughs> <laughs> are there some some modern uh, personalities? You mentioned by Salimli. Salimli is a great scholar. The Talmudic mind, I mean, I'm a lawyer, but when we went to law school, the professors used to tell us if you uh, have a Talmudic mind, you've got a head start already on, on the study. You are lucky, because in the modern language, if you say in America, you and your Talmudic mind is an insult. They mean it as an insult. Is that right? I can tell you some very renowned uh, political figures and, 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 and teachers from Harvard and so forth. When they say, ah, you and your Talmudic mind, it means an insult. That yeah. means it's, you, you turn it, everything, and then... That's that's new one, but uh, okay. Uh, they, they used to tell me how to tell Munich mine, but I'll, I'll accept That's it. a compliment. All right. We have uh, a lot of Muslims in the world who are very good people. They follow Islam, which is a very good religion. It's uh, uh, It believes in monotheism, but there's a lot of trouble in the world between the fundamentalists. First of all, is your uh, foundation working on this issue too? No, it's a very small foundation, but we mainly what we do to organize these conferences on, on summit levels, and we take care of a thousand Ethiopian children in Israel. Really? Yeah. It's my, my wife is, is actually guiding and conducting this project. A thousand Ethiopian children, uh, because they had problems in school, uh, their parents cannot help them. They come from a different century almost, right. and we give them the best, literally the best teachers. So, the worst in class become the best in class. The University of Haifa has graduated the first uh, Ethiopian mm -hmm. lawyer, and uh, she's now going to practice. Mm -hmm. I am well familiar with the University See, of Haifa. Sure. So am I. All right, we're going to cut for a break. We'll come back, and then we're going to discuss the Pope and uh, see how Talmudic he was in his statement about the uh, Muslims. We'll be right back. Get best-selling author Leon Charney's latest book, The Battle of the Two Talmuds. Join Charney as he explores years of Jewish history to find out why and how Talmudic scholars and rabbis abandoned the Holy Land for the lands of the Diaspora. Learn about the power struggles behind the creation of the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds. It's a book critics call engaging and enlightening, a book which will be of interest to people of every faith, now available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, or download the audiobook of The Battle of the Two Talmuds at iTunes or Audible.com. Leon Charney sets out to discover the true meaning of the Kaddish, the Jewish custom of reciting a prayer to commemorate the death of a close relative. Join Charney as he finds out the history of the Kaddish and how it has evolved. Reviewed as a refreshing walk through Jewish history and a book that deserves to be read by both Jews and non-Jews, The Mystery of the Kaddish is now available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at audible.com or on iTunes. Discover The Mystery of the Kaddish. We're back. We're having an in-depth discussion about philosophy, life, Judaism, Israel with Eli Wiesel. Couldn't have a better counterpart. Eli, the Pope's statement everybody knows about, and uh, <laughs> you've met a lot of popes, probably. No, you never no, met the Pope. No, I'm supposed to. I, I met John the Twenty-Third when he was nuncio, a cardinal in Paris. I was supposed to meet John Paul the Second, who wanted to meet me. Everything was arranged, but I had conditions set. Really? Should, absolutely. I didn't want to a uh, cir circus. And uh, then it was leaked. And what do you mean? You can't believe I was I was besieged by journalists. I wanted to be there when I meet the Pope. So I cancelled. Really? Yes. 
Everything was said. Rabbi Lau told me a great story about the Pope, uh, the one that just died, <coughs> that when he went to see him, he's the chief rabbi of Israel, they came from the same town. And the Pope remembered that he saved one of his, his friends. And the first thing he asked him when he saw Rabbi Lau <coughs> is, whatever happened to his friend? I don't remember the name. And the po uh, Rabbi Lau told me the fellow lives in Brooklyn. It was a very emotional story, a very emotional meeting. Uh, this pope seems to be <coughs> truly a scholar in, in theology. And so there were, there were two trends of thought. One, one was that he really wanted to program this type of statement because he's worried about the minority of the Christians versus the Muslims and that uh, maybe it's good to put it on the table. The other thought is that it just raised a lot of jihad in the Muslim community. What do you think about this? Leon, when the Pope speaks, he doesn't just speak off the cuff. I know. Everything and is prepared. And when he apologizes, he doesn't. But you know, everything is prepared. It has, it has gone through so many eyes, so, so many minds that God. He wanted to say what Absolutely. he said. Absolutely, I course. agree with you. Therefore, his apologies, there are no apologies. Four times he tried to apologize and didn't <laughs> succeed. Because they were well written. <laughs> he, couldn't, he didn't succeed saying, I'm sorry that I wrote it. He said, I'm sorry I hurt you. <laughs> I'm sorry you misunderstood me. Instead of saying, I'm sorry that I said it. <laughs> he, didn't. he didn't want to say that. He didn't want to say that. No, absolutely not. I, I agree with you. Everything is preordained. Everything went, of course, it was scoured. And it, it's like uh, when the president does a State of Union address, and I've been through them, everything is scoured. Everybody knows what's going okay. on. So what do you think? What it, Give me your opinion of, of this fundamentalism. You know, it used oh. to be, Elian, tell me where I'm wrong or right. I used to think that if you gave a great education and you great ability for man to make a living that you would not have fundamentalism. That has totally changed. There are people who commit suicide who are lawyers, who are wives with children. What is going on philosophically? You have to tell me. What happens to these people? Oh, they, they simply, we had that in, in the 20th century, there were two fanaticisms in plural. One political, Moscow. The other one, racial, Berlin. The world was divided and between, between these two. Right. Uh, today, a third one dominates the world. The 21st century just began, already dominated by, by, the, by, by a new fanaticism, an old fanaticism, religious fanaticism. But it's new because it, it uh, invented a new method of killing by committing suicide. Which means they believe now in the cult of death. And therefore, once somebody is taken by that cult, that somebody doesn't want to, 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 to die, but he wants to kill. In order to kill better and more, he joins his death to the death of his victims. And, you know, I, I, I go around for the last few years, really, organizing conferences on fanaticism all, all over the world, because I, I worry. I worry because imagine a suicide terrorist, really, with a pocket-sized nuclear weapon. One day it will happen. I remember 30 years ago, yeah, 30 years ago, a friend of mine who was a banker took me, showed me his first computer. The computer, he had a huge room, a huge room with that machine. Right. The energy of that is today in a, in, in a sharp, uh, sharp, whatever you call the ectic organizer. Right. So I'm afraid. Now, what do I... I organized here two years ago, together with the Prime Minister of, of, of Norway, in this case, co-sponsored and co-chaired, co called Fighting Terrorism for Humanity. 20 countries, on summit level, 20 countries participated in it. And they had no answers what to do against suicide terrorists. So I had the only possible method, or at least a kind of methodology, I said, let us decide that suicide terrorism is a crime against humanity. It is not going to stop the suicide killer, but it will stop those who help him or her, who help him logistically, financially, and to be That's charged. Idea, by the way. So what we do now, we, I'm, I'm planning a, a conference, you are a lawyer, with law professors. I need definitions. What makes an assassin 
a terrorist. What makes a terrorist a suicide terrorist? What makes a suicide terrorist a criminal against humanity? Once we have that, we will push it through all the parliaments and, well, well, and the United it's very, Nations. It's very clever. I don't have to tell you, you're being very clever. But what you're saying is anybody who conspires to create automatically becomes is a partner in the crime. Partner in the crime against humanity. Right. The crime against humanity is very special. First, there is no statute of limitations. Second, extradition is obligatory. It's mandatory. All the members of the United Nations must abide by it. So therefore, they will think twice. How has that been accepted? Twelve presidents came to me right away and say, give us the definitions, we'll bring it to our parliaments and we go through. Twelve and twenty. The others also were waiting. That's key. This is crucial. What yeah. you've come up with is key to the survival. I think this is, this is the thing to do. And I think so far, and I've interviewed thousands of people, you're the only one who's given me a con concrete idea of how to attack this problem. And I'm going to bring it forth to a lot of people. Because I have a Talmudic mind. <laughs> but you said it's not such a, it's a, maybe an insult. I don't want to say you have a Talmudic mind. No, I, for me it's you a compliment. And I accept for me it's a compliment. You and I accept Talmudic minds. It's a, it's a very important idea, and whatever we can do to help publicize it, I'll, we will. I'll, I'll keep you informed. I'll, no, I'll, that's, I'll, that, that I'll take is, you in. I mean, I ask this question day in and day no, so out. Do I. And it's not, it's not economics. It's not, it's not uh, education, because education has to be liberal. If you teach a Mormon in a Mormon school, he becomes a Mormon. If you teach a Hasid sure. in a Hasidic school, he becomes a Hasid. Sure. So it, this, this idea, it's always education, doesn't work. So what you're saying is, is a crime against humanity can be tried for that in yeah, courts. In courts. Sure. It's a very, very, very important. It's the first time I've heard it, by the way. And uh, uh, thank you for your Talmudic mind. See? Okay, so let's agree that the Pope has Talmudic mind. <laughs> no, he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> we remember, don't insult the Pope. <laughs> remember what, Christians have adopted the Bible, but not the Talmud. Christianity has rejected the Talmud. Who burdened the Talmud? Christianity. And, uh, Louis, Louis IX, for some reason, still, still being called Saint Louis, he's the one who ordered the Talmud to be burned. And, and, and Rabbi Hill of Paris, who, was a, who went a rabbi in Paris, wrote a marvelous litany about it, a heartbreaking litany about, about the burning of the Talmud. So, you know, Talmud, you say Talmud to Christian. It's not such a bracha, not such a blessing. It's not. You've been asked this question a thousand times, Eli. Uh, I want to throw it out just to hear you. Does anybody know what causes anti-Semitism? You know, when people ask, so I'm, I'm, asked, I'm sure times. people ask you and me the same All questions. The and usually, what they say is, why do people hate you so much, you Jews? And my answer is, why should I make the haters' task easy? Let the hater say. <laughs> why should I say it? Ask the hater, why do you hate the Jews? And they can't, by the way. It's visceral. It's in their gut. Because. It is irrational because the hater doesn't need reasons to hate. He just hates Jews. They live in a world of delusion, an unreal world, thinking that we have the power, that we control the world, that we dominate the economy, and we are everywhere. That's what they believe, really. And what is an anti-Semite? The anti-Semite hated me before I was born. Never met me was indigenous to his culture. I had the Polish ambassador on the show, and I said to him, why is Poland so anti-Semitic? And he said, it's indigenous to our culture. So therefore, he was honest. He, very honest, and he was not anti-Semitic, by the way. <laughs> so the further question is, what causes hate? Oh, but all the contradictions merge in, in, in that hatred. They hate us because they say we are too powerful or too weak to believers or, 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 not, or not believing enough, or we are too atheistic, we are too nationalistic or too universalist. 
No, but I, I'm talking about generically, forgetting Judaism, why does one person hate, hate. another person? What causes hate? And I'm sure you've studied that. No, not only that. I organized conferences on it with the greatest psychiatrists, the greatest educators, and the Nobel laureates in the world. What we discover, something very interesting, a child begins to hate only at age three, which means the child is learning hatred. But that means a child can unlearn. So hatred. it's not genetic. It's not genetic. So it's taught by the parents or by but another influence? <coughs> environment, by peers, and by culture, by religion. It's not, it's not hereditary. So you can transform that hate by giving a person a better education? Is that, is that a fact or not a fact? Yes, it's supposed to be. What is education? Education means to sensitize the student to someone else's fears, someone else's joys, someone else's lives. And the moment that someone knows that I'm interested, hatred is, is, is already abandoned as an option. And you can counter that with love? Does that help? That's a Christian term, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you fell in love with your wife. <laughs> anyway, we're going to cut for a break. We'll come back and have our final session with Eli Wiesel and then wish him a good trip to Israel and hope that he comes back and tells us what he found out over there because I'm interested to see if people talk to him about what they said to me, putting this idea of Israel never existing or ceasing to exist on the table. That'd be interesting. We'll be right back. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high to have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Winner of the Telly Award for Best Cultural Program. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. Now get the book the hit movie was based on, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the Backdoor Channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian Peace Treaty. Become a witness to history and order Backdoor Channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order Backdoor Channels. Available now over iTunes, Amazon, and Google Play. Leon Charney's cantorial CD in Disco Long. Listen as Charney movingly sings El Mole Rachamim and Charney's amazing rendition of a disco remix of Adon Olam, all sung in the incredible and individual Charney style. Also listen to the CDs on Rhapsody. Download Leon Charney's cantorial songs in Disco Lam, the disco remix of Adon Olam on Amazon, iTunes, and Google Play. Or listen in on Rhapsody, all available now. We're back. We're talking with Ellie Wiesel about a lot of topics which really are going to affect the world. He's a humanitarian and a philosopher and a writer, etc., etc. Has Germany redeemed itself? I think Germany really made an effort. And I think Germany deserves praise for that. First, it became a democracy. For the first time in its history, it became a democracy. The Weimar Republic was really a kind of a parenthesis. And also what Germany has done f for the victims of, of, of Germany. Uh, giving money, compensations, and what they call shilumim in, in, in Hebrew, Payments. retribution. And after all, they paid. They helped Israel. And therefore, uh, and also I know I have students from Germany who are really so very, very special. The good ones are very good. The, the others are very bad. That means in the middle you have, of course, the, 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 the great zone. But the, uh, the, the anti-Semites are, are the worst, and, and the anti-anti-Semites are the best. But I'll tell you something which happened. I, I was invited to address the uh, Bundestag, the parliament, in its first session when it came to Berlin. It was in the Reichstag. It was in the year 2000. And everybody, of course, came to the opening, and I was the speaker. And at the end, I turned to the uh, president, so Mr. President, Germany has done good things for the Jewish people. One thing you have not done. You never ask the Jewish people for forgiveness. What did he say? It's anything. But a week later, he was in Jerusalem, addressing the Knesset, 
asking for forgiveness. Really? Yeah. When Ben Gurion decided to accept reparations, you were a young guy. Were you in Israel then? No, I, I never lived in Israel. <coughs> I, was, I was a journalist for Yediot Achronot in Paris, and I was sent to cover the first meeting of the Israeli German delegations. It was in Holland. What was your feeling? I was against it. You were? Yeah. But at the end today, would you say it was a good decision? I'm not sure. Really? Why would Because it, it shouldn't have come down to money. I see. It was only a matter of money. And it should have remained uh, on it a It demoralized the whole incident? It, 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 I think it cheapened it anyway. It became money. How much money? The problem was not money, but how much money? That was the question. And I felt it was too soon. So I asked, uh, and I spoke to Ben Gurion, to Goldman. Of course, I wrote every Russell day. I, I wrote every day articles against it while there. And then Ben Gurion said, but we needed the money. I said, why didn't we get it from America? Little did I know that even the money that Germany gave us came from America. <laughs> <laughs> And Guri is an interesting man. He made very, very tough decisions, and I guess in the beginning he had to. Uh, he was a great the, man. The decision of Alatalena was a very tough decision. But a bad one. Yeah. The Alatalena, for the audience who doesn't know, was a ship that was being brought in by the Yirgun uh, during '48, and Ben Graham, making a very short uh, order, Yitzhak Rabin, who was then commander of the, the Palmacho, the Israeli army at that point, to fire on that ship. And that's been a crisis in Israel's memory for the more last. Than 20, more than 20 people died in, in the waters. The ship was on fire. And all aboard the ship were survivors of the Holocaust. A thousand people. And, and you go further. These people who were surviving the Holocaust, they go to Israel, or get, they try to get through the blockade of the British, and they go to Cyprus. Britain, Andre Bevan, all those names, they, they, they took people from one, one camp into another camp. How do they, how they survive well, that? The it people? was a disgrace. But they stayed there. And then, but then, immediately, the moment the state was proclaimed, immediately, the next step, really, from Begoyon, was first of all to give the army to defend the country, but then to bring in all of these refugees, and they came in. Ellie, you were born in Poland? No, in Romania, Hungary, Transylvania. Pennsylvania. When, I, when my father was born, it was the Austro-Hungarian Empire. When I was born, it was Romania. When I left it, it was Hungary. Now it's <laughs> Romania again. It's good music. <laughs> and music is good. <laughs> what did your father do? We had, he had a, a grocery store. But he spent most of the time really uh, with the community. He was uh, very much involved. His occupation really was to visit the prisoners and, 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 and save those who came from across the border from Poland, not to be sent back to Poland. And you were an Orthodox family? Very Orthodox. Hasidic family. And he studied Talmud? Absolutely. <laughs> You're a Hasidic family. Actually, sure. I'm a Vishnitz Wow. To That's an age family. I have to explain this to our audience. Uh, the Hasidic community is uh, basically each town. The Lubavitcher Rebbe from Lubavitch, the, the Belzer Rebbe uh, from Belz, they all had their towns. And Hasidim were a special sect of uh, Jews who, as I said before, went contra to uh, the Vilna Gaon, and they said that they can accept God through song and dance and mm -hmm. merriment. Now they became very big scholars. The Lubavitcher Rebbe okay. was a huge, huge scholar. What's your theory, or I guess maybe you don't want to say why he never visited Israel? Do you have a theory on that? I asked Did you ever ask him that? I knew him very well. I knew the Rebbe very, very well. We were very close. So but each time we began our discussion at late at night, but many times, I always had a ritual. I said, Rabbi, I'm not one of yours. I belong to Vishnitz. <laughs> <laughs> now let's talk. Did, uh, he, did he have an answer for that? The answer really was that if he had gone to Israel according to a strict law, one is not supposed to leave Israel again. And therefore, he wanted to stay with his Hasidim in, in Brooklyn. That's an interesting... Uh... That's an interesting kind. I've heard that before also. Yeah, and he yeah. told that to you directly. No, not directly. But I, I, heard, I heard it. But my question was a question, but then I got the answer through somebody. Well, we see Israel today. We see a lot of uh, 
fun, not fundamentalist, but a lot of right wing, a lot of middle wing, a lot of center, a lot of secularist. It's a homogeneous society. What do you see when you go to Israel? I go to Jerusalem right away. I love Jerusalem. When I visited Jerusalem for the first time in '49, wow. I had a feeling I had been there before, about 2,000 years earlier, literally. Really? And now when I go, each time I go, it is as if it were the first time. Really? I, knew, I knew really the topography of Jerusalem before I knew the topography of my own town. From my studies, every little street, and they have names of the prophets and the sages. And, so to me, Jerusalem, of course, is, is the soul of our memory. Memory, too, has its soul. And do you think that Jerusalem can be divided? Do you think it has to be one, or you don't, you don't want to get into I, that? I don't want to get into that, really, because whatever Israel will decide it will be all right. And I think my, now my optimistic, strangely enough, I'm optimistic now. I think what we must do is help Abbas. He is the best that we have. Strengthen him. And I'm convinced there will be two stages. Condoleezza Rice is trying to do something very interesting now, post the Lebanese war. She's over in the Middle East now, yeah. you may meet her. And she's basically getting to the Sunni regimes of Egypt, Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. and Jordan, who are really hypercritical of the, uh, of the uh, Hezbollah during the beginning of the war. And mm -hmm. she's trying to make an amalgamation there, and then to bring Abbas in there to, to mm -hmm. make him strengthen. The question is whether Hamas can, 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 can make some kind of agreement. They're still holding the soldier, by the way. They, they don't give up Three Israel. soldiers, Hamas holds and Hezbollah holds. Three all together. Right, but they offered, the Israelis offered this 1,000 prisoners for one, and the Hamas turned them down uh, yesterday or today. I represented a fellow named Rusty Lutz one time. Rusty Lutz was a super spy in Egypt in 1966. Lutz, yeah. Lutz, Lutz. The horse, he had some, he was... <laughs> <laughs> he had a horse. He had a horse. He, he infiltrated the whole Egyptian cabinet. He was successful in pinpointing Aza Weitzman's great strike in 67 on the Air Force. And he wrote a book, The Champagne Spy, 5,000 for one. And Israel traded 5,000 for Rusty Lutz. And I got to tell you, he was a great spy. He looked very German. He was blonde. Yeah. He had a not Jewish wife, but he was one of the greatest spies in, in Israel's history. And you're right, he loved horses. Look at the memories we have here. It's I never met him, but I know about him. He was a fascinating guy, and cherubic and gregarious. Phenomenal guy. I mean, there, there's certainly a movie. I mean, he infiltrated to the highest level. Like Eli Cohen government. in Syria. Eh. Eli Cohen. Eli Cohen. He, he got killed in Syria. He was a super spy in Syria, and he got killed, and still a lot of memorials for him in Israel. He almost became defense minister. <laughs> <laughs> I think Lutz would have been prime minister. I mean, this guy was unbelievable. He was great. Anyway, let me talk to you. Poland's president visited Israel about three weeks ago. I was in the country. Uh, and then I told you this remark about the Polish ambassador. He said that anti-Semitism is indigenous to our culture. Uh, can Poland redeem itself, in your opinion? Oh, it could. Young people, they're, they're some young intellectuals are very good. Courageous, yeah. yes. Uh, Miknik, uh, who is the head of Gazeta Biborska. And the Geremek, these are young revolutionaries, young, they are already in the 60s, I think. But, you know, the government of Poland today includes the Minister of Education, who belongs to an anti-Semitic group. Is that right? Absolutely. So much so that Israel is boycotted, boycotting him. And it's a strange situation, because as Minister of Education, he deals with Auschwitz. Uh -huh. The Yad Vashem boycotts him, because he is an anti-Semite. Yad Vashem is the uh, memorial, the authority. Uh, yeah, the, the huge, huge uh, yeah. memorial to the Holocaust victims. You tell me, there's a lot of confusion about the Scandinavian countries during this uh, World War II period, Denmark, Norway, and Scandinavia. I'm sure you've studied them. Mm -hmm. Were they anti or pro? Where were they? <coughs> Denmark well, saved the Jews, most of the Jews, right? Norway, no, did not. But I, I just came from Norway months ago. I was there to open the museum. The museum, the Holocaust Museum, is situated in what used to be Quisling's home. In the beginning, I thought, 
oh no, not there. And I thought, yes, there. He must turn in his grave every single day. Chris Link, who was, you know, the, 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 the epitome of collaboration, of fascist collaboration. When you say Chris Link, it means traitor. Right. Chris Link. So in Chris Link's home, now there is a Holocaust museum. <laughs> <laughs> Very Tom Mutic. And uh, so we have Norway, Sweden. Well, Sweden had, had it. Sweden accepted Scandinavian Jews from Norway, those who could escape, and Denmark who could escape, went to Sweden. Sweden was neutral. In the beginning, it was pro German. It sold a lot of war material to Germany and, and allowed German, I don't know, foods or even soldiers to go through its territory. Uh, and the, the uh, Bernadotte wasn't such a great, a great friend of the Jews. Can I that? So it's difficult to say. It's a neutral, neutral, which at one point, at one point, near the end of the war, they accepted many, many inmates from Auschwitz and so forth. I read a book about King Boris of Bulgaria. Yeah. He say no Jew was uh, killed. Is that no correct? Bulga yes, no Bulgarian Jew. But Macedonia was part of Bulgaria. So the Macedonian Jews were handed over to the Germans. I was, I was in Macedonia. Uh, I was, then I was a, a presidential envoy. And I met the Jews there. Macedonian Jews were not safe. Really? Although, although they were under the authority of Why the do you think? I read the book on, I I'm sure it. you did yeah. too. Why, right. Why did, uh, why did King Boris, why did he King Boris? Not only King Boris, the church. The church helped King Boris. There was a, really a, a kind of united front not to allow the Germans to kill the, the, to, to kill the Jews or wow. to deport them. We ran out of time, Ellie. I got to wish you a great trip to Israel. Come back Thank and you, see Hatsumaya. me. Thank you, Have a good yom -tif. You too. And uh, we'll talk about how Israel will live eternally when you come back. Pleasure. See you next week.